Wi-Fi in schools is safe. True or false? We don't believe in putting antennas near schools, so why are we so willing to put antennas inside schools? That's right, Wi-Fi routers are microwave antennas. One type of microwave radiation we are all familiar with is the microwave oven. What do microwave ovens and Wi-Fi routers have in common, and how do they differ? Both use the same frequency and both have the same wavelength. This is the ideal condition for heating water. They differ in that Wi-Fi routers use a much lower intensity of radiation. The radiation is not contained. It consists of pulsed waves rather than continuous waves. More about that later. And the Wi-Fi router is on all the time. For these three reasons, we should be concerned about placing Wi-Fi routers inside schools and inside our home. Let's have a microwave cooking lesson. We can bake a potato in a microwave oven set at 100% power within 6 minutes. If we reduce the power to 50%, it will take twice as long or 12 minutes to bake the potato. This is called the time-weighted exposure. Now let's replace the potato with students in the microwave oven with a school. Students in school are exposed to microwave radiation for 6 hours a day, 5 days a week, for 40 weeks each year. That comes to 1,200 hours a year of exposure. After 10 years, they're exposed to microwave radiation for 12,000 hours. Let's put this 12,000 hours into perspective. The Interphone study was published in 2010. This study showed that adults who used a cell phone for more than 1,640 hours over a 10-year period had a 40% increased risk of developing a brain tumor called a glioma. How does this exposure compare to Wi-Fi in schools? Interesting. And yet we are told that Wi-Fi in schools is safe? Here we have the electromagnetic spectrum that organizes the electromagnetic energy according to frequency and wavelength, with low frequencies at the bottom and high frequencies at the top of this chart. Scientists have given names to different parts of the spectrum that have similar characteristics. At the bottom, we have extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields. Then we have a band called radio frequency radiation that overlaps with microwaves and radar. Wi-Fi fits into this category at 2.4 gigahertz. At even higher frequencies, we have ionizing radiation that is known to be carcinogenic. Both radio frequency and extremely low frequency fields are classified as possibly carcinogenic by the World Health Organization. Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and microwave radiation has many of the same characteristics as light. For example, light can be transmitted through windows, reflected or focused by mirrors and glass, absorbed by dark colors. Similarly, microwaves can be transmitted through buildings, reflected and focused by metal, and they can be absorbed by water and fat. That is why we can cook a potato in a microwave oven, but we cannot cook dry rice. True or false? Levels of microwave radiation in a room are uniform. False. A filing cabinet, as well as other metal objects, can either decrease or increase our exposure to Wi-Fi radiation, depending on its location relative to you and the router. Taking a measurement at the middle of the room will not give the same reading as taking a measurement near a metal object near your computer or near the router. Metal objects on or in your body will also reflect, block, or focus microwave radiation. This is why sensitive people are unable to wear jewelry. A student with a mouthful of braces standing near a router is likely to have higher radiation exposure in the head than a student not wearing braces. True or false? Natural sources of radio waves are much stronger than man-made sources, so we have nothing to worry about. False. This graph shows altitude above sea level. Ionizing radiation is largely absorbed by the upper atmosphere and very little reaches the Earth's surface. The same is true for infrared radiation. Both light and radio frequency radiation reaches the Earth's surface. So we are exposed to radio frequencies coming from outer space, but these sources are very weak. That is why we need large radio telescopes to detect the energy. These microwaves are like whispers from outer space. 
A cell phone within 10 kilometers of one of these receivers is similar to a shout and would interfere with a signal coming from space. That is why radio telescopes often have an exclusion zone surrounding them to minimize this type of man-made interference. True or false? Our exposure to microwaves is increasing exponentially. True. Much of the early research with microwaves was kept top secret. In 1939, we had the first radar exposure of the military. In 1967, the radar range, or microwave oven, was introduced. In 1984, we were introduced to cell phones and the cellular antenna system. In 2000, we had our first exposure to campus-wide Wi-Fi. In 2004, we had the first WiMAX operating. This is now called LTE, an acronym for long-term evolution, also for long-term exposure. In 2008, schools began to install Wi-Fi routers. In 2010, smart meters began to be placed on homes to record electricity, water, and gas consumption. So most of our exposure to radio frequency microwaves dates back about 30 years. Here are some of the major changes in our exposure. In the past, our exposure was intermittent. Today, it is constant. The radiation is no longer limited to military bases and airports. Today, we have transmitters inside our home. In the past, exposure was limited to a few occupations. Today, infants and children are exposed. We can use the flood analogy to describe the increasing levels of microwave radiation. Low levels have no effect, but as the level rises, a few people are adversely affected. Those below the line have become electrically hypersensitive. As the level continues to increase, more people will become adversely affected. True or false? Wi-Fi radiation is pulsed, and pulsed radiation is more harmful. True. We don't know all the reasons for this, but one reason is the way it's measured. Here we have radiation that is not pulsed. The maximum value and the average value are quite similar. With pulsed radiation, the maximum or peak value is much higher than the average value. And since many health authorities measure only average values, they underestimate exposure considerably. The intensity of radio frequency radiation can be measured using power density. Guidelines in various countries differ orders of magnitude, or by 100,000 units. This is unheard of for chemical toxicants and for ionizing radiation, where standards globally are quite similar. The worst guidelines are in the UK, but Canada and the United States are not far behind. Guidelines in Russia and Switzerland are at least 100 times more protective. These guidelines are not effective because adverse effects occur at much lower levels of exposure, as shown in red. True or false? Industrial strength Wi-Fi is used in schools. True. Indeed, this is how some companies advertise their powerful wireless routers. True or false? Wi-Fi base stations constantly emit radiation. True. Wi-Fi base stations or routers in the school have multiple antennas. These antennas emit a beacon signal. The routers are placed at various locations, as shown in this floor plan. Each router emits microwave radiation that is always on. With multiple routers, the entire school is blanketed with microwave radiation. True or false? The highest exposure is at the computer and at the router. True. Once the computer is disconnected from the internet, the only remaining radiation is from the router. So the placement of these routers is critical. They should be well marked in plain sight and as far away from people as possible. True or false? The more users uploading and downloading information from the internet, the higher the levels of radiation. True. And the closer students are to each other, the higher their exposure. True or false? Long-term, low-level exposure to microwaves harms rats. True. The U.S. Air Force completed a study in 1984 at a cost of $4.5 million. They exposed rats to pulsed radiation at 2,450 MHz. This is the same frequency used for Wi-Fi. At levels well below federal guidelines for 21 and a half hours daily for 25 months. The results were published in 1992 and became available on the internet in 2005. The results show that rats exposed to microwave radiation had more B cells and T cells. 
These cells are part of the immune system and become activated when the body detects unhealthy bacterium. The T cells alert the B cells that in turn produce antibodies to attack the bacterium. What is unusual is that this experiment was conducted under sterile conditions. That is one reason it cost so much money. Even more disturbing results were the effects on tumor growth. Three types of tumors were identified in various organs, benign, primary, and metastatic tumors. A summary of the results are shown here in Table 2. What are the effects of long-term exposure to low levels of pulse 2.45 gigahertz, also known as Wi-Fi radiation? A 16% increase in benign tumors, a 100% increase in metastatic tumors, a 260% increase in primary tumors, and it affects the immune system. Is this what we want to expose students and teachers to for six hours each school day? True or false? Radio frequency radiation is a possible human carcinogen. True. The World Health Organization classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic to humans. They base these conclusions on rat studies, of studies of people who use cell phones, and on studies of people who live near cell phone antennas. In their press release, because they mention gliomas and wireless phones, some falsely believe that only cell phone radiation was potentially carcinogenic and that we didn't need to be concerned about other forms of radio frequency radiation. But this is not the case. Wi-Fi radiation is a possible human carcinogen. Let's look at other effects of pulsed microwave radio frequency radiation. True or false? Microwave workers experience heart problems. True. Studies on the health effects of microwave radiation go back decades, although some of the early studies were classified. In this symposium proceeding, published in 1969, the authors write, In the interest of occupational hygiene, many Soviet investigators, and at least one U.S. researcher, have recommended that cardiovascular abnormalities be used as screening criteria to exclude people from occupations involving radio frequency exposures. In other words, radio frequency radiation affects the heart, and scientists knew this 42 years ago. True or false, radiation from a 2.4 gigahertz cordless phone affects the heart. True. This was a double-blind study that was published in a peer-reviewed journal. Subject A was wearing a heart monitor and was exposed for three three-minute periods to radiation from a cordless phone or to sham exposure. The heart rate remained relatively constant, 58, 56, and 58 beats per minute. This subject was exposed during the second time interval, but did not respond to the provocation. Subject A is non-responsive. Subject B has a rapid heart rate during intervals 3 and 5, which coincide with exposure to the cordless phone. This subject experienced tachycardia, a rapid heart rate, and is highly responsive. Exposure was at less than 1% of Health Canada's Safety Code 6. True or false? Students are experiencing heart irregularities at school with Wi-Fi routers. True. Several students have visited their pediatric cardiologists and have worn heart monitors to school. Here are the symptoms they experience. Six-year-old girl, musical heart, headaches, dizziness, only at school. Twelve-year-old boy, tachycardia. Twelve-year-old girl, nausea, vomiting, no fever, insomnia, blurred vision, tachycardia, only at school. Thirteen-year-old boy, heart pounding, insomnia, headaches. He moved away and his symptoms have abated. World-famous cardiologist Dr. Stephen Sinatra explains what may be happening to these students. What these kids basically have is they have non-diagnostic tachycardia. Uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is a, it's, it's not uncommon, it's about one in 700 kids. Uh, so if you've got 50,000 kids in the stool district, I mean, do the math. You're going to have some kids with, this is an inborn situation where a child has an extra, what we call, electrical pathway in the heart. And uh, th these hearts can go uh, out of rhythm and uh, they can be triggered by situations that can disturb heart rate variability. And as a cardiologist, knowing what I know now, uh, it's easy for me to connect the dot 
that a child with Wolf Parkinson White, undiagnosed, exposed to Wi-Fi, could be triggered with an arrhythmia. Uh, Superventricular tachycardias are uh, what we call SVTs, and uh, adults and kids have these all the time. And uh, again, because uh, Wi-Fi disturbing uh, uh, heart rate variability, it could be a factor in children. True or false? 2.4 gigahertz affects the blood. True. This is what my blood looks like in a clean electromagnetic environment. Few cells are separate, and a few cells are sticking together. This is what my blood looks like after I used a cordless phone for 10 minutes. My blood cells are sticking together. This is called Rouleau formation and shows an unhealthy condition. The consequences of Rouleau formation are reduced oxygen transport to cells and tissues and reduced waste removal. Symptoms may include headaches, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, numbness, tingling in extremities, dizziness, nausea, and weakness. These are the very same symptoms experienced by people who are electrically sensitive and by some students at Mountain View School as shown in the following video. True or false, students at school are getting sick with Wi-Fi. True. Hi, I'm Austin Lamond and I'm 14 years old. Uh, I'm, I go to Mountain View School. I've been suffering weird headaches and dizziness and displacement. Like, it feels like my head is, like, there's a lot of pressure in my head and it's, like, repulsing like this. And I just feel, like, displaced and then when I'm not there, if no, nothing happens, so. And, like, I get really, like, weak and, and like, I can't, it's hard to hold a pencil, too, and I can't think straight. Starting this year at Mountain View, um, I've been getting a lot of headaches and it's been making me really dizzy. And um, like it feels like like I can't concentrate and you feel like you're not really there. It's hard to explain. The thing that concerned us was that she always got better when she got home. And um, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We got our eyes checked and found out that wasn't it. And actually had everything checked and found out that wasn't it. And she still, to this day, when she goes to class, probably about, probably about four out of the five days that she's there, she's coming home with a, with a headache. And I mean significant headache where she has to take Tylenol or Advil. True or false? 2.4 gigahertz affects sperm. True. Studies with human sperm cells showed that sperm exposed to Wi-Fi radiation near a laptop computer were much slower and had DNA damage. The authors speculate that keeping the laptops in Wi-Fi mode on the lap near the testes may result in decreased male fertility. Does Wi-Fi affect female egg cells? We don't know, but if it does, exposure of one generation may have consequences on future generations. True or false? Microwave levels in schools are too low to have any effects. False. Dr. Tony Mook was asked by the Superintendent of Education to measure two schools in Ontario. The testing was completed in November 2010 and was released February 2011. This report concluded that all the observed levels are far below exposure limits currently established by proposed major international and national agencies or organizations for public, including children, or occupational exposure. These conclusions are wrong. On page 5 of the report for Mountain View School, one reading is 34% above Health Canada's Safety Code 6 guideline, which is 1 milliwatt per centimeter squared. The check guideline for pulsed radiation for six hours a day is 0.004 and is much lower than Health Canada's guideline. Our study with heart rate variability showed response at 0.003. 43% of the measurements in the school exceeded the values that caused heart problems in adults in our study. Disturbingly, this is the same school where students complained of heart palpitations and headaches. Here are results of radiation levels in classrooms, blue bars, as they are compared with radiation near cell phone antennas, red bars. In Ontario classroom, with no routers and no computer, the level of radiation was very low, 0.01 microwatts per centimeter squared. 
With one computer accessing the internet, radiation jumps to 12.5 units, and with one cell phone accessing the internet, it jumps to 40 units. In a classroom with one router, radiation levels are much higher, even though no computer is accessing the internet. In a Vermont school, the levels of radiation were almost the same as the levels 100 meters from a cell phone tower. Levels near the laptop and near the routers were even higher. Several studies have documented adverse health effects experienced by people who live near cell towers. Here are a few that provide exposure levels. Here are the levels at which people experience symptoms of electro-hypersensitivity. Cancer. Problems with the immune system. Problems with their nervous system. And reduced sperm count. Yet we are told that levels in the classroom are too low to have any adverse effects and that the guidelines are protecting us. Cell phone antennas should not be placed near schools and Wi-Fi routers should not be placed inside schools. So what are the options? The worst option is the one that most schools are using, Wi-Fi everywhere, always on. This is the high-tech and low-intelligence option. A better option is the modified Wi-Fi. Here schools limit the location and the time of use and adjust behavior. The best option is a wired connection, which is both high-tech and high intelligence. The Parliamentary Assembly Council of Europe agrees. In their resolution 1815 on the potential dangers of electromagnetic fields and their effects on the environment, they recommend for children in general, and particularly in schools and classrooms, give preference to wired internet connections and strictly regulate the use of mobile phones by school children on school premises. There are five wired alternatives to wire there are three wired alternatives to wireless. Ethernet, which many schools already have, so their Wi-Fi system is redundant. Fiber optics, which is perhaps the best option, but makes sense only if there is fiber optics in the community. Otherwise, it's too expensive for most schools to afford. The third option is the power line adapter. Several makes are available. Basically, you purchase two adapters. One connects to the router, the other to the computer. Both have an Ethernet port, and both are plugged into an electrical outlet. These adapters convert the wiring in a building to an Ethernet connection. Each computer needs its own power line adapter. This method is faster than Wi-Fi, more secure, more energy efficient, less expensive, and best of all, it does not emit microwave radiation. Wi-Fi radiation is not safe. It promotes tumors and rats. It affects sperm motility and viability. It causes DNA damage. It causes rouleau formation of the blood. It, de it contributes to headaches, dizziness, nausea, weakness, and concentration problems. It causes arrhythmia and tachycardia. It damages the heart. It may cause heart irregularities in as many as 1 in 700 students. If half an hour a day exposure to cell phones contributes to brain tumors, can we be so sure that six hours of exposure to Wi-Fi in schools is safe? How much confidence do we have in the system when exposure exceeded guidelines in one school where the students are complaining of headaches and heart problems and nothing has been done about it? In the end, can we afford to make mistakes? If you care about the health of students and teachers, share this video. And if you have Wi-Fi at home, consider replacing it with a wired connection. Ask your neighbors to do the same. Thank you.